Good morning. Good morning. Christ the Lord is risen. And thank God for that gift of grace. It's good to see everyone this morning. Welcome to the service of worship here at First United Methodist Church. We are glad you are here. I encourage everyone in attendance, please fill out the registration cards. They're found there in your bulletin, and that will allow us to be aware of your presence and any concerns that you have. If you're a first-time visitor with us, they look like this. Please uh, fill those out. The announcements are before you in the bulletin. Um, I won't read all those to you. I do have someone waiting in the wings. Now, where did she go? Hmm. Has anyone seen Brenda? Oh, there she is. <laughs> Good morning, Brenda. Good morning. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Does this give you a clue? Party time, right. <laughs> but specific kind. And here we go. <clears throat> me, me, me. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. <laughs> okay, I won't sing anymore. And no, we didn't write that, but boy, he sure filled in right. Um, <laughs> I am here to tell you birthday bash potluck is coming up. It is May 15th. That is one month after tax day, so you should be able to remember it. And... It's a potluck, so bring a dish to share. Meat will be provided, and of course, some form of birthday cake. Please sign up in Fellowship Hall. Do it today after church. They have to know how many numbers of things to fix. Any questions? And I won't sing when I leave. Have a good day. <laughs> you never know what might happen around here. <laughs> That's right. Um, and we have a, uh, uh, the mother of a star in our uh, congregation this morning. Let's see, where's Lana Hoy? Oh, is she high? Oh, there she is. Hi, Lana. Same spot. Same spot. No, I know that. Um, we just found out that Lana's son, Daniel, and his wife, Becky, <clears throat> are going to be on HGTV next Saturday, 9 o'clock p.m. on um, House Hunters Renovation. So if you have any free time, you might want to tune in, and, and then we can, um, we can let Lana know what we think about the remodeling. <laughs> so just some, uh, just some information in the life of our congregation. Things are happening. Please keep Francis Stevens in your prayers, and all the other folks that uh, are listed on prayer list. And if you'd like to be uh, a participant in our prayer life here at First Church, please uh, contact Ruth Courtright, and she will uh, get you praying if you're not already. I'd like to invite everyone now to stand and greet one another in the name of Christ.
At this time, let us prepare ourselves for worship as we hear our prelude. Morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Even in the midst of our questions, we will praise the Lord. Even with fears of what, what might be, we will praise God for God's mighty deeds according to God's surpassing greatness. We come with faith that is growing in spite of this. Praise God with song and dance. Let us offer worship and praise to the living God, the risen Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Let everything that breathes praise God. Praise God. Let us pray. Life-giving, life-affirming God, we come this morning remembering the joy of Easter while facing realities of this world. Fill us with the hope of new life that resurrection brings. Help us open our hearts to answer the never-ending, unconditional love of this Easter season. Be with us now in our time of worship and remain with us each and every day as we walk our paths of life in faith. Amen. Our opening hymn is Thine Be the Glory, page 308. Please stand as you are able.
be seated. Join me in our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 5, and I'll be reading verses 27 through 32. When they, and the they there is the temple police, had brought them, the apostles, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. a morning like this when the sun still hid from Jerusalem and Mary rose from her bed to tell the Lord she thought was dead Was it a morning like this when Mary walked down from Jerusalem Two angels stood at the tomb, bearers of news she would hear soon. Did the cross sing? Did the earth rejoice to be again? Over and over, like a trumpet on the ground, did the earth sing to the And as they raced for the tomb, beneath their feet was there a tomb. Did the cross sing? Did the earth rejoice to be new again? Over and over, like a trumpet on the ground, did the earth sing to come? Over and over in a never-ending run, 
scripture lesson this morning is from the book of John in the New Testament, chapter 20. I'll be reading verses 19 to 31. This first section is titled, Jesus Appears to, his, to the Disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The next section is titled Jesus and Thomas. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in the side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And the select section is titled The Purpose of This Book. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Choir, thank you for that wonderful message and music this morning. What a way to start our second Sunday of Easter. Now, when are we going to have the uh, choral introit? Well, that, that was it. Oh! No. Thank you, Mary Beth and choir. Thank you for that blessing. My friends, will you please bow and say a word of prayer for me? Abba, Father, you are the potter and we are the clay. Mold us, mold me into the image of Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Some time back, former talk host Johnny Carson visited Harvard University to receive an award. And after the ceremony, he agreed to answer some questions from uh, members of the press. And one reporter asked him a, a strange question. And he said, what would you like to have inscribed on your tombstone? And Carson thought for just a second. And he answered with the words he used before every commercial break. I'll be right back. Now, that may not apply to today's scripture, or it might. Because one person that the disciples weren't expecting back was Jesus. They were surprised. And there was one disciple, as we know, Thomas, who was not present when Jesus came back. And Thomas struggled with what he heard from his, his brothers and sisters in the faith. A car was involved in an accident, and a large crowd had formed. You've seen the rubberneckers before. They all seemed to come out of nowhere. 
and they surrounded the victim and a reporter who was trying to get uh, 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 you know first on scene incident going on and he he got up there and he couldn't quite see and so he yelled please let me through I'm the son of the victim and people of course they made way and when he got up there he was a little befuddled when he discovered the victim was a donkey Not many of us would trumpet the news that we are the son of a donkey. And yet I must confess that at times in my life I have felt kinship to a man who has been portrayed as a donkey and his name is Thomas. Yes, doubting Thomas. In today's scientific world, many of us tend to relate to doubting Thomas. Because like him, we want empirical proof, something we can touch and see in order to believe in this risen Messiah. But in the Middle Ages, the Germans used the donkey in their religious art to represent Thomas. The donkey was, of course, a symbol of foolishness. And believe me, Thomas was no fool. Even more importantly, Thomas is in good company. There was once a fine Scottish pastor named George Matheson. Matheson wrote the famous hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. And in the early years of his ministry, Matheson had a crisis of faith. He began to be plagued by, by feelings of doubt. And finally, he decided that to remain true to his conscience, he must resign from his church and leave the ministry but his church would not let him go. They told him to, to stay and to, and to preach as much about Christianity as he could believe in. So he stayed, and gradually, as he served that church and its people, he was able to deal with his doubts and to grow beyond them. And Matheson discovered that the answer to doubt is not convincing, is not some convincing argument, but life with God's people, doing God's work, participating in, in the call of Christ to go out and to change lives and to make disciples for the transformation of the world. Eventually, it was faith, not doubt, which had the final say in his life until he could write the words to that beautiful hymn, O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean depths it flows, may richer, fuller be. I guess George Matheson belonged to the fellowship of donkeys, those who come to faith the hard way after struggling intensely with doubt. But don't we all from time to time struggle with doubt? Don't we time to time have questions about our faith? Don't we all belong to that fellowship of donkeys? Who among us has not spent at least a season of our lives in the company of doubt? Once a woman boasted to Dwight L. Moody, the powerful evangelist of yesteryear, Mr. Moody, I have been saved for 25 years and I've never had a single doubt. And Moody replied, Madam, I doubt that you're saved. This walk of faith, this sojourning of faith is not an easy walk. There are times when we are confronted with things that we don't understand and that challenges us. It creates doubt within. It creates doubt. Once, what more often you care about your faith, the greater your struggles with the question of God's existence and God's relevance to your life. Would it surprise you that many pastors struggle with doubt? You're just all looking at me. <laughs> Pastors struggle all the time because they're confronted continuously with things 
they don't understand either. And when you walk in this faith, you have to learn to trust that there's someone bigger than you, bigger than me, in charge. I was reading recently about the famous psychologist Carl Rogers, and I don't know if you know this, but at age 22, he entered Union Theological Seminary in New York. And while there, he participated in a seminar organized to explore religious doubts. And Rogers later said of the group, the majority of members in thinking their way through questions they had raised thought themselves right out of the ministry. And he said, I was one of them. Now, I don't know if you got that, but Carl Rogers, Dr. Rogers' admission, he might have become a minister rather than an internationally known psychologist, but he became entangled in a web of doubt. You know, I've seen that happen to many of my colleagues who aspire to the work of ministry. The more that is at stake, the greater the struggle. A casual faith that does not affect the way you live requires no intense debate. But when you are staking your life's vocation on the validity of your beliefs, you long for some sense of certainty that what you are seeking is authentic. And that may have been what was happening to Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas, but there was nothing insincere or phony about this disciple. It was a donkey. If he was a donkey, so are some of the finest followers of Christ who ever lived. Who can forget that scene involving Jesus' friend Lazarus, who was dying? Word came that Lazarus was mortally ill. His sisters Mary and Martha said, please come. They lived in Bethany. Jesus was a marked man in Bethany. There were people looking to stone him. And what was Thomas's reply? Thomas cried out. Let us also go, that we may die with him. Thomas realized what was at stake. To follow this man, Jesus, could end up, he could end up losing his life. To me, that doesn't sound like a person who means to merely dabble in the faith. Thomas truly wanted to serve Jesus, but the idea that anyone can rise from the dead was simply too much for him to grasp. And who can blame him? I don't know if you heard the story about a man in Easter, uh, eastern Kazakhstan who was apparently electrocuted while trying to steal power cables. Uh, this man was pronounced dead and was wrapped in cloth, a cloth shroud, and buried in a shallow grave. Imagine how shocked his friends and family were when he turned up for his own funeral. According to a local newspaper, this man regained consciousness uh, after uh, two days after his near-fatal accident. He rose naked from the ground, and the paper further reported he surprised family and friends as he showed up for the funeral. Could you imagine the look on their face? Okay, yep, put aside the image that he was naked. But he was, who, he was pronounced dead, and there he was. They had given up hope on Jesus. He died on that cross, a horrific death. They took his body from that cross and they put it in a borrowed grave. And now he is before them. He's before them. 
You know, people don't know what to do with folks who rise from the dead. Oh my gosh, look at that TV show, Zombie Land or Zombie World. I don't know what they are. You know what they are, Lexi? Is it? No? Good. Don't, don't watch the show. It's, oh, The Walking Dead. Jesus isn't the walking dead, my friends. Jesus is the living Christ who conquered death for our sake so that we might know, so that we might know new life, new life in Him. And so that we might know the will of God, that God has more for us and that God does not want us to, to fear the unknown. God has plans for you and me. So who are we to blame Thomas? You know the words, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the mark of the nails in his feet, my hand in his side, I will not believe. Those were Thomas's words. And we can sympathize. We have trouble believing sometimes ourselves. And then God breaks into our lives and we see those nail-scarred hands and feet. And we can almost reach out and touch the place in his side. There was a story in Guidepost magazine years ago. It was about Dorothy Nichols originally of Greenwood, South Carolina. She, she wrote about sitting at the table in her current home in Florida talking to her next door neighbor. These neighbors were a young couple who had helped Dorothy and her husband several times over the preceding year and a half after Dorothy's stroke and her husband's leg injury. And unexpectedly, the young husband began telling them the story of his troubled past. At age 16, he'd fallen in with the wrong crowd in his hometown of Greenwood, South Carolina. Yes, the same Greenwood, South Carolina, that Dorothy and her husband now called home. This young man lost his way for a while and spent a year in a reformatory school for youth. When he was released, he became desperate and decided to rob a local service station so he could have enough money to leave the state. He stole his father's car and gun and just before closing time, drove to the service window of a gasoline station. He was about to demand all the money from the woman manager. But just then, he explained, he looked up and saw a sign overhead at the station and it read, God is our security guard, always on the job. And he said that was, that was all it took. He knew he couldn't rob that place. He then rushed home and prayed all night. He was determined to get his life straightened out. With God's help, he reports he did. And as he finished telling the story, Dorothy looked at her husband. Both of them remembered a night 13 years ago when Dorothy sat at their kitchen table in the hometown of Greenwood, South Carolina, trying to make a sign for their business. She had scribbled down several words, and then finally it came the slogan that her husband put on the sign that stood on the roof of the small service station they managed. God is our security guard, always on the job. Now we can say, oh, well, that was a coincidence, who knows? Or maybe Christ was coming to Dorothy and her husband just as he came to Thomas to say, it's real, it's no illusion, I am here, I am alive, untimely, I, ultimately I am your security guard. I know there have been coincidences in my own life that I cannot easily dismiss. Many times they have caused me to doubt my doubts. Thomas wanted to believe just as we want to believe, but until Christ appeared to him in person, Thomas simply could not. He could not take that leap of faith. He could not make that leap of faith. 
But that is where many people are today. Maybe that is where you are today. People of faith can have doubt. If so, let me make some suggestions to you. First of all, you may find Christ best by serving him. That is what George Matheson discovered as he pastored his church there in the Scottish Highlands. He was able to deal with his doubts and to grow beyond them. And gradually, Matheson discovered that the answer to doubt is not some convincing argument, but life with God's people, doing the work of the kingdom, answering Christ's call. Faith is self-validating. As you live it, it becomes a reality in your life. As you live it, it becomes a reality in your life. That is what Dr. Diane Comp discovered. Comp is a pediatric oncologist. She works with children who have cancer. She claims that she began her medical career without any faith in God, a woman of pure science. But her young patients unshakably found God in the face of death, and eventually it brought Dr. Comp to God. She found God by serving God's children. As she says, why are there so many innocents suffering in the world? There isn't any answer, but there are three ways to handle the question. We can decide God would not run the universe this way, therefore there is no God. Or we can be so angry at God, we give him the silent treatment. Or we can have a conversation about all of this with him. And that conversation is called prayer. And we can give God a chance. And Dr. Comp gave God a chance, and now she is a dedicated believer because she took that leap of faith and put her faith in the risen Christ. Now, there's a second thing we need to see, and you don't come to faith all at once. I know early on in my faith walk, I had friends that say, well, can, can you give us your, your uh, renewal birth date, you know, the date you gave your life to Christ and that you knew it, and they could quote a date and a time and a place. Mine was not that way. It was more gradual, much more gradual. Actually, it, it took some years before I could actually say, yeah, God, I believe. I believe. And I know in all those years that I struggled with my faith, I can now see where God was walking with me every step of the way. Every step of the way. I did not walk alone. I did not walk alone. So many Christians misunderstand the doctrine of rebirth. They think if they heed the Master's word to be born again, that immediately they will become all God means for them to be. But being born again is just what the word implies. You become a tiny baby in, the, in your spiritual walk. It's a beginning. It's a place to start. And after a while, you grow as you practice your faith, as you practice the means of grace, and as you practice mercy. It is unrealistic to think you'll become a spiritual, mature Christian overnight. It, it doesn't happen that way. There's a wonderful story about Bible scholar Dr. Andrew Bonner. Bonner sent Charles Spurgeon a copy of his newly written commentary on Leviticus. And Spurgeon was so blessed by the exposition that he returned the book with this notation. Dr. Bonner, please place here in your autograph and photograph. 
Soon the book was returned with this message from the saintly but elderly Dr. Andrew Bonner. Dear Spurgeon, here's the book with my autograph and photograph. If you had been willing to wait a short season, you could have had a better likeness. For soon I shall be like him. I shall see him as he is. I shall see him as he is. Dr. Bonner was affirming this principle. My friends, we are on a journey of spiritual growth. Every day is another lesson. It's another opportunity to learn more about our Christ, about our God. It's a journey. We start out young, and someday we will grow up, and our hands and our feet and our body and everything we do will be to honor and to praise God. But it all is dependent upon our determination, and that is exactly what we have to be. We have to be determined in the faith. And it's okay to doubt. It's okay to struggle. We walk with good people. Thomas was a strong believer. He had doubt. But the risen Christ appeared before him. And he believed. And what does Christ tell us? Blessed are those who believe without seeing. We are among those people, my friends. We are among those people. Finally, we are not to regard at the end of the journey because our faithfulness but because of God's faithfulness, we are not rewarded at the end of our journey. You have to forgive me. I'm trying to focus bifocals here. I need to readjust my, my pulpit. We are not rewarded at the end of our journey because of our faithfulness, but because of God's faithfulness. There will be many occasions in our spiritual journey when we will want to throw up our hands and quit. If it all depended upon our determination, that is exactly what would happen. But it does not depend on us, but upon God's promises. Just when we are ready to quit, God will come to us and show us, God will show us enough of himself to maintain us on the journey. And we will retain our membership in the fellowship of donkeys, not foolish, just struggling stubbornly between faith and doubt until the day comes when faith conquers all. Let us pray. Lord God, there are those times in our faith journey that we have doubts. All of us, Lord, we have doubts. And we ask that you would surround us with your, with your presence and make your presence known to us in those times of struggle. Help us to see you even in the small things so that we know we do not walk alone that you are with us in this wonderful journey of life, this wonderful journey of faith. For we pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite you to join in. From the faith we sing, our hymn of response, we walk by faith.
2196. You may remain seated. Patty Barr could not be here this morning, but you have probably, or I hope you have, noticed all these colorful t-shirts at the front of the sanctuary on the altar rail. This is a mission outreach to um, the families in Haiti. Uh, this is called Bundled Bottoms, and what it is is it op offers um, women in Haiti an opportunity to um, have a job. As they make these uh, diapers from our used T-shirts, um, it gives them dignity and it also provides um, a, a much needed service to their children. So this morning as we have brought all these in, um, and I encourage you to continue to bring them in this week, I'm not sure when uh, Patty's sending them in, but uh, if you'd like to bring some more in, that would be fine. But at this time, let us, uh, let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to do mission, to do outreach to those in need. Lord, as we send these colorful t-shirts to the impoverished country of Haiti, we ask that in some way they will be a blessing we ask that you surround our brothers and sisters in Haiti with your presence. Pour your spirit of hope and grace and mercy out upon them. 
Bless the gifts that we give to them, that they might know you more fully. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to join in our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. Ever patient and loving God, the excitement and joy of Easter have faded. Our doubts and fears are creeping in again. We somehow need to see to believe. We long for the priest that Jesus breathed us. We feel too vulnerable, afraid to ask. We long to affirm with Thomas, my Lord and my God, but we sometimes lack the conviction. Forgive us our doubts, our fears, our reluctance to witness to you and to the risen Jesus. We pray for the courage and conviction of the disciples who overcame their fear to become mighty witnesses. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. The one who loves us and frees us will not leave us in despair and doubt, but will fill us with all joy and conviction. Let us praise and witness to the Holy One, Jesus the risen Christ, the one who says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is with us always. Let us pray together now the prayer that he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In offering all that we are and all that we have to you, Lord, we witness to our faith, and we pledge our commitment to you and to your world. Let us give thanks to God for the gifts he has given. Lord, receive now our tithes, gifts, and offerings, and magnify them to the glory of your will and your kingdom, that it might be made known here on earth and glory be given to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let the ushers come forward as we hear our offertory.
My friends, may God, who is Alpha and Omega, who is and was and who is to come, fill you with faith and conviction. May the risen one fill you with peace and joy that you may affirm your faith and may you go forth from this place and share God's grace and God's mercy with the people you meet and you testify to the risen Christ. Go now in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My friends, go with God and go in peace. Amen. Please remain standing and join in our closing hymn, Christ is Risen from the Dead. The words will be on the screen morning this is a new hymn for us and so we would ask if you would like to uh sit out for the first first listen to the choir go through it and then uh join us during the chorus thanks Jumping over. 